Griffith Observatory, Satellite Studio. Here we go. Hello, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, you guys hear me? Okay. Um, thanks a lot for coming out um, in the audience over here and across the um, everyone live on stream. Um, uh, it's great that you guys can make it out in this beautiful Los Angeles day where there's no rain whatsoever outside. <laughs> so, um, we're really excited to give you guys a sneak peek of what we've been working on for the last couple of years. Um, we love to show you guys more. We are early on in the show. Um, and well, I'm sorry, we're, we're near completion and we're heavy in the show development. Um, so legally, we can only show so much and we pulled and, and argued and got as much as we can get uh, in front of you guys today. So uh, quick introductions, which was done here. I'm the visual effects supervisor. My name, my name is Ji Young. I'm joined by two super talented artists on the team, Eric Keller and Tom Bradley. <laughs> Um, <laughs> first off, I want to say thank you very much to uh, Pixelogic and um, thanks to, for having uh, the support of the, the ZBrush on our show. We couldn't have gotten a lot of what we've um, developed throughout the couple years on this show. Every, almost every shot, I think, we utilize the uh, ZBrush as our, one of our primary tools to get this thing going, and it's been great. We have talented guys like these guys up here. We also have guys that have never used ZBrush on our team, and they have literally uh, went out, purchased it, got a Cintiq, and now they're really into it. So it's great to see. So thank you very much to Pixelogic. Um, a little bit back, uh, background about me, I'll go by this really quick. So I've been in uh, uh, visual effects for about 20 years. I worked at studios like um, Rhythm Hughes, DreamWorks, Bad Robot. Um, done a bunch of stuff in uh, games and VR. Um, now I'm kind of working with these guys in academia and science, and some of my credits on here. Um, the first time I ever worked with ZBrush was in 2006, and some, some of my work here, really quickly, just to show you. Uh, this is some of my hobby stuff that I do with ZBrush. I love, I'm a big fan of it. I, I say to myself, if I can only have one program and nothing else, ZBrush would be the program I would, uh, would want to have. Um, there's, there's the first copy of ZBrush I ever <laughs> <laughs> bought. Fantastic cover. Is so I still niche? have it today. So um, maybe some of you guys might have this copy as well. Um, as you guys might know, this, this building, this is the Griffith Observatory. If you guys live in Los Angeles, I'm sure you're familiar with it. If you guys have visited Los Angeles, I'm sure you guys have seen it. It's a fantastic hike. You can see a fantastic view of Los Angeles, and you have an amazing view of the Hollywood sign. Um, as stated, it is a uh, historic Los Angeles landmark, established in 1935. And I apologize, this is going to be a little slide heavy in the beginning. I'll try to get through as fast as possible, but it's really important to kind of give you guys context to who we are, what we're doing, what's our show about, and a little bit of technical stuff, okay? So, sorry about the PowerPoint. <laughs> um, Griffith and Hollywood have had a love affair for quite some, some time. These are some of the movies and shows that have kind of been uh, shot on location. And it goes back to 1953 all the way to today. So some really, really big name films like Terminator, Back to the Future, The Rocketeer, um, Transformers, La La Land, obviously, and some shows like Dancing with the Stars and um, Chips. Star Trek. <laughs> <Cheers>. <laughs> Eric Estrada. 90210. That's a big one, right? So, uh, And our, we work for the City of Los Angeles and the Department of Recreation and Parks. So, got all that boring stuff. So, Signs of Life, okay? Um, Signs of Life is a show we're working on. It's a 35 minute planetarium show premiering in May 2020. So, again, we're, we're hot and heavy. There's a lot on the farm as we speak right now. Um, Tom's fighting for his render to get out as we speak. And losing. <laughs> and losing, really, losing really badly. To me. Uh, <laughs> it's a cutting edge and immersive event that happens once in 10 plus years. So the last show that was developed and created was 12 years ago. Tom happened to have worked on that show back then. Um, that was rendered Maya Mental Ray. Yeah. PR man. PR man. So yeah, back in the day. And that's showing now. So by all means, I highly recommend if you guys have time, go up there, take a look at it. It's, it still holds up for, for 12 years old. Um, let's see. Uh, 
So the show, so basically just a little bit, the show itself, when, when I started this show and when everyone came on the team, it was important that we uh, know that science is first. So everything you guys will sort of see, or a lot of what you guys will see, we think of the science initially, right? We don't go in and we start building things out of our imaginations. There will be a lot of that in the show, but our obligation is to make sure that we develop a show that's grounded on science. So what we know about Mars, what we know about the universe, what we know about our own planet, it all starts there. And then we infuse that with a lot of what we understand from cinema. So we've hired in filmmakers, award-winning director. We've brought a team of ex, uh, talented professionals that have worked in uh, cinema and visual effects for many, many years. And we've infused that show. Uh, the, the mission of the observatory itself is to inspire everyone to observe, ponder, and understand, understand the sky. And it all starts in the planetarium itself. So this is a little bit of an image of the Samuel Ocean Planetarium. This is kind of our stage and our platform for our show. Uh, some, some facts about it. It's a 76-foot immersive dome. It's going to be projecting 8K, 60 frames a second. We're rendering at full 8K. So that's a bit of a challenge. And that's why I said our render farm is packed right now. We're going for photorealism on the show. Uh, this, it seats about 260 people, um, and it's got a 28.2 um, point surround sound system. And again, the last show that was, that was um, created and crafted for it was 12 years ago. And the show that we will release in May 2020 will run for about 10 years. Um, in the center of it is a, what we, uh, it's a, projector, a laser projection system called the Zeiss which looks like, I call it the retro death machine, because it really looks like, you know, Austin Powers lifting this crazy thing from the center of the ground, and it, but it is the most beautiful thing when it's projected in pitch black. It is the most accurate and the most, if you were to look at stars uh, inside of building, and you expect it to look really, like, not like what you see out there, this thing will make it look like what you would see if you didn't live in Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but we all, we, before we could get the show going, we actually had to actually build a studio. So just to give you a little bit of context, we didn't have a, a anything at this point. So early on, uh, part of our team, our core team, led by Don Fidrick, who is our producer, basically established and built this facility that resides right by the Los Angeles Zoo. Um, and we, had, we had the venue, we had the observatory, we had the san, uh, planetarium, and we had the state-of-the-art equipment to project it. But we needed this environment. We also needed something to kind of preview and show our show on a daily basis to kind of see what was working and what was, wasn't working because the, uh, the main planetarium itself was being utilized on a day-by-day -day basis to the general public. So, And we had then established our team. So we brought the team. We brought the hardware. We set up the pipeline. We all eat together. We all share the same one single bathroom in the whole studio. And... And, and, uh, but we, we're, we're having a lot of fun. It's, it's, a, it's a fantastic team. And we put them through the paces because what we do is we have, a, um, we have this kind of uh, fun little thing where at one point we, we had a unicorn pinata that we filled with candy. And we make our team go through the most awkward way of getting that candy. And that pinata is represented right there. So <laughs> they have to insert their arm in a very special way. So. <laughs> it's a special moment. <laughs> Uh, so what do we render? And I would try to power through this so we can get to the fun stuff that uh, Tom will talk about. So we render uh, for the planetarium something called a Dome Master. Okay? A Dome Master essentially is a fish-eyed lens. Okay? Ultimately, if you envision it, and I'll go through it really quickly, is if you render an image that looks something like this, where the middle of it is right above your head, and the bottom of it is really your kind of what we call the sweet spot. This is a Dome Master fish-eyed format image. And here on the left, you see that Dome Master image as it represented a grid. On the right, it's represented on a kind of mapped onto a half of a sphere. And then you can kind of see from a perspective that you would look at in, as an audience member. And because it's a 180 degree surrounded image, to kind of represent an immersive environment to be in, Directors want to basically be able to guide the view of the audience and have an area of interest in a sweet spot is what we call it. And that's represented uh, circled in red. So that's what we kind of get the audience to kind of focus and hone, hone in on. And if you have been in, in the observatory, you'll know that the seating is shaped like a kind of a horseshoe shape. So there is an area where the audience kind of 
look at. But we're trying to make this experience work really well in full, like kind of anywhere you look, anywhere you sit. Uh, this is a kind of a, a lat long image that represents where if you had uh, what we're rendering and you kind of put it in a format that's more understandable, this would be it. And on the bottom in the green line, the dashed line is your spring line. And when you convert that to a dome master, it looks something like this. So our frame is essentially this, and our curtain is anything outside of that spring line. So it makes it a little bit challenging as a show to kind of keep everything kind of moving and the idea of things kind of falling out of frame is difficult to achieve. Things coming into frame is a little different. It's much like working in VR, in virtual reality, where you really don't get to have the benefit of traditional cinema tricks where you can kind of, you don't want to quickly cut. You want to kind of transition from one shot to the next. And here's the same kind of lat long representation of one of our shots. And here's what it looks like as a dome master, okay? And I'm gonna stop talking now. And I'm gonna introduce our, um, our talented artist, Tom Bradley, who's um, going to show how he's merged science with art and talk about his, his process in developing Mars, okay? So. Thanks, Chief. <laughs> Morning, everyone. <laughs> Part of it. He really did make Mars. <laughs> uh, yeah, just to follow on with what G's talking about, what, <clears throat> what I'm going to present is a little bit of a workflow. It's a production workflow of how we make terrain on the show, and specifically the terrain of Mars. Um, <clears throat> what's good about Mars is it's been very well covered by satellite imagery, and that imagery is available not only to us, but it's available to all of you. It's free. So if you're into terrains and you want to make Mars on your own computer, this is how you would do it. So just a little bit about me. You know I'm not the mayor already, so we won't talk about that. <laughs> uh, my career started right here at Noman in 2001. Took the fast track, the Maya fast track, and it's been great ever since. Uh, used the usual suite of tools that uh, probably everyone in this room is familiar with. Uh, I am somewhat of a noob when it comes to ZBrush. I didn't really use it until I started on this show about two years ago. Um, I'm certainly not a master sculptor like <laughs> this guy is, but I, it didn't take me long with my background in production to realize there were some things that I could do in ZBrush that I couldn't do anywhere else, and it really opened up the creative possibilities for things like terrain. So let's talk about Mars. Uh, this is what it looks like from space. You all have probably seen Mars one way or another over the years. Uh, there's a little list of factoids there that you might find interesting. The main takeaway is that Mars is about half the size of Earth. Uh, it has very low gravity compared to Earth. If you weighed 100 pounds on Earth, you'd weigh 40 pounds on Mars. Be a tough way to lose weight, but you know, <laughs> maybe, maybe uh, Elon can help you out with that. <clears throat> There's a very thin atmosphere. If you're standing on the surface of Mars, it's the same as being 100,000 feet above the surface of Earth. And it's very cold, has a low average temperature. It's not a great place. I don't know why everybody wants to go there, but <laughs> it looks beautiful. Now this is what the surface of Mars looks like if you were actually standing there. This was taken, an image taken by the Opportunity rover, uh, which is no longer with us. But you can see kind of what the colors of Mars truly are. It is beige. It is reddish <laughs> beige, and the sky is almost yellowish. And that's because everything's covered with dust. This is Mars as I created it in the computer for Signs of Life. So you've kind of got the real Mars, and then you've got CG Mars. And the reason I'm able to get this kind of detail and to recreate m the Martian look this well is because there is a place on the web uh, where you can download information, high resolution images of Mars. And this particular image is made from that data. And this is actually a, a real place on Mars called the Hellas Basin. And I used uh, real scientific data to create it. So how can you get this to create Mars in the comfort of your own living room? 
You go to a place, if you look at this first bullet point, you go to a place called uahighrise.org. And UA stands for University of Arizona, and High Rise is a, an acronym, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute. So you start, you go get the data. The data comes in a strange, funky, proprietary scientific file format that you have to convert before you can use it in the tools we're all familiar with, like Houdini and ZBrush and Maya. Uh, to do that conversion, you need a, another little piece of software called QGIS. Uh, it's free, the data from HiRISE is free, so you can go and access all this stuff just like we do. We're not doing anything special, we don't have any special contacts to do this. Um, once you've done your uh, conversion of the file format to like a .tiff, then you can go to Houdini or Maya or ZBrush with it and use it just like any other displacement map. And of course that fourth bullet point there, that's just kind of, you know, your standard production workflow. So this is a quick look at HiRISE. This is the uh, website, the University of Arizona website. They uh, developed the uh, experiment and they also operate it. As you can see from the photograph, it's basically just a big old honking telescope with a camera CCD attached to the back. Um, it has incredible resolution powers. It can resolve things down to one meter on the surface, uh, basically 30 centimeters per pixel. And that is the highest resolution camera flying around any extraterrestrial planet in the solar system. It's attached to an orbiter called the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. And it's also affectionately known as MRO. And you can see high rise kind of hangs off the bottom there and it's pointed down at the surface. Um, MRO zips around the planet uh, at 112 minutes. It's a small planet, but it's also flying very fast, and it's about 150 to 200 miles up when it takes these images. So what kind of images can you get from high rise You can get a whole suite of images. Um, you can see they're in strips, and that's one of the shortcomings of high rise It's ultra high resolution, but it's very narrow strips of information. You don't get the broad coverage of the entire planet that you might want, so you have to do tricks to fill in around that. But you can get black and white images. You can get black and white with an RGB strip down the middle, which gives you a false color representation of what the surface might look like. Uh, that middle thing called a stereo anaglyph, that's where it starts to get interesting because each time high rise flies over the planet, it'll take a picture of a strip, it'll do an orbit, it'll come back to that same area and it'll rotate the spacecraft just a little bit and get a slightly off angle image of the exact same location. And from that you can create a stereo pair. If you had stereo 3D glasses on and you looked at that image, it would jump out at you. But what's even more important for us VFX artists is that you can create a DTM, a high-rise height model that is a displacement map, basically. And that's what that black and white image is next to the anaglyph. And then you get the, the color altimetry um, image, but we don't use that for much of anything. Um, so once you get these, these are in this weird proprietary format. It's, it's a .img format, but it is not a disk image, which is what I thought it was when I first saw .img, and that's probably what most of us think it is. It's a, a proprietary format created by Erdos, and it's their Imagine format whatever that is, but you use QGIS, and this is a little uh, screen grab of the interface of QGIS with uh, a particular DTM dropped in, and out of QGIS you can spit out a .tiff. And with that, you can jump over to Houdini and you can displace it using your basic terrain tools workflow. Uh, don't have to put down too many nodes, don't have to jump through too many hoops and all of a sudden you've got a nice, beautifully detailed, high-res chunk of Mars on your computer. And that's when it really gets cool, because you can fly down into that and see what it's like to stand on the surface of Mars. I'd never done that before, it totally blew me away <laughs> when I did. So out of Houdini, you just export FBX, and you're into ZBrush. This is a particular, uh, this is a screen grab of the interface, we'll jump into ZBrush here in a second. Um, this is the actual set from the shot that is in Signs of Life, and you'll see that shot here today. That little tiny white strip in the middle of the screen, that's where the camera is. That's a high resolution, high rise 
strip that's been displaced, and then we fly the camera over that. The two larger pieces that envelop that small strip are the exact same strip, scaled up 50 times and flipped around to create the rest of the set that goes out to the horizon. So we're really cheating. We're just using one high-rise DTM to create the detailed area where the camera is, and then we scale that up and just run it out to the horizon so it looks like there's more terrain there than there really is. So if I jump over to ZBrush. This is the actual ZBrush production file. And as you can see, it's pushing about 40 million polygons. So I'm not going to try and spend too much time <laughs> navigating around in here, but I am going to zoom in on this spot. Maybe, after everything wakes Maybe. up. Maybe. There we go, there we go, there we go, it's happening. And, oop. and as you can see, there's a lot of detail, but we fly the camera so close to the surface of this DTM that we have to have the detail. The trick is we don't need the detail all over this massive set. We only need it where the camera is. And as we keep zooming in, and we keep zooming in, this is the full high-rise strip here. The camera flies approximately in a path like this. And as we zoom in and keep zooming in, you're just going to see more and more detail. And that's what sells terrain. The closer you look, the more detail you see. Uh, terrain looks small when it loses its detail. But the problem with, like I said, with a set like this is we need a lot of detail around the camera, but we don't need it everywhere else. So we can't use a traditional displacement workflow where you tessellate all the geometry and then put in a displacement map and hope that you get the detail you want next to the camera. And that's where ZBrush really killed it because I could put the, Z the detail exactly where I wanted it. And the way I did that was I adaptively tessellated using ZBrush those areas where I wanted to stamp down extra detail. So this is the high-rise DTM. It's pretty detailed to begin with. But if I click over here on one of these other pieces that has been subdivided selectively. So I just painted a mask and then inverted the mask and then hit Control-D. And that gave me these areas of additional and increased um, resolution so that I could go in and paint higher and higher detail. But as you can see, it's not everywhere. And if I hadn't done that, let me show you what the original, how we started out here with this. You can see we've got tessellation issues big time. That's the untessellated, scaled up 50 times high-rise DTM. And that's the high-rise DTM. I mean, that is like topological hell. <laughs> trying to bridge that gap. <clears throat> so this adaptive tessellation that I was able to do in ZBrush allowed me to do that. Now one of the, one of the ways I got Mars detail on these uh, subdivided um, pieces of geometry, uh, let me go to uh, edit mode. And clear my canvas, bring up the light box. And I'll just give you a quick demonstration of how I used this <clears throat> and not try and work in that humongous model. <laughs> and go back into edit mode. Give this a little bit of thickness. And then I'm going to subdivide it up to about 2 million polys. Turn that off. Go back in the light box. So what I did was I set up a bunch of Z alphas. In fact, before I do that, let me open up this extra box, close brushes. I'm going to just set up my little alpha palette over here. Go back to light box. So I've got these Mars alphas. Now, if you look at all these alphas, these were created from high-rise DTMs. So I brought the high-rise DTMs into Photoshop and made 16-bit PSDs so I could use them for alpha stamps. 
So you can see that you can create a lot of really cool, interesting details with terrain by using high-rise alphas as the source. And so if I grab one of these, hopefully, there we go, and change over to drag rect, and just drag out, you can see We've got some pretty cool things happening already on the surface. And that's real Mars stuff, you can tell by the craters. But where it starts to get fun then is when you go back in and you grab another one. Let's see what this looks like. And drag another one out. Now you can start to build up terrain that's unique to your creativity based on real Mars surface data. And that is like way cool, at least to me, <laughs> as, a, as a total space nerd. Um, <laughs> and you know, if you don't like the displacement you're getting, you can always scale that out. And it gives you the beginnings of the terrain, and if you were to Maybe this was like a world for a game. This whole thing was a world for a game. But your camera was only going to fly through this valley. Then you could use the adaptive tessellation that I talked about just down through this valley and then go in and use these same stamps at higher resolution to get more and more detail as you get closer and closer to the surface. And go back to slides, which is this guy. So just real quick, this is uh, an animatic of what the shot was designed as, but it was done before anybody knew about high-rise. The artists that made this at the observatory didn't realize that high-rise data existed, so we're not flying clear up in the atmosphere anymore. We're down in the weeds uh, on the surface where it gets really interesting. So let me show you. Yeah. <clears throat> so let's go to full screen on this. So this is what the shot actually looks like. And if you were sitting in the dome at the Samuel Ocean Planetarium, you would see if you were facing front, which you are by default when you sit in the seats, it faces you in this direction. But as you can see, this is a full dome immersive experience. So I had to build enough terrain that went all the way around to the back, all the way around to the front, and all the way out to the horizons, and that's why I cheated with those larger pieces. And if we play this, you can see we're flying over that crater, and as we fly along, people in the seats can turn their head and they can see this. Or if they look around in the back, they can see this. Or on the other side. and you really get a sense of being immersed in the environment. And this sky is a, a scientific reproduction of um, what the sky on Mars would actually look like. Uh, because of the dust in the sky, it gets bluish around the sun, not reddish like it does on planet Earth. Turn that off. Go back to slides. And that's all I got. <laughs> Turn it over to this brilliant guy, also known as Eric Keller. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Uh, hey, I'm Eric Keller, and I'm going to talk about rocks, too. Um, <laughs> So I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I've been using ZBrush since about 2004. So I've been on ZBC, uh, ZBrush Central, for, since 2004. And of course, uh, I need to update my, uh, my portfolio. If you guys haven't checked out the new ZBrush Central, it's really awesome. It's very easy to use to create a portfolio. Uh, when I started out, I was doing scientific stuff for the Howard Hughes Medical Institute way back in 1998. Um, and back then, I was doing a lot of cellular molecular type animations. So if you guys saw the new presentation yesterday, kind of similar to that kind of stuff, but way back in the late 90s. 
Uh, I came out here about 2005. I've taught at Noman off and on for about 10 years. I taught ZBrush here. Uh, and then I also worked in both scientific illustration and visualization, but also in the film industry. It's actually where I met G. I worked with G at Bad Robot. We worked in, uh, on uh, Star Trek Beyond together, so he was my visit, visual effects soup on that show. Um, so, um, so I've done a bunch of movies and I've done a bunch of science stuff. What I love about this planetarium show is it combines all my love into one project, so it's one of the most fun things I've ever done. Uh, you guys, if you know my work, you probably know that I, I have a fondness for insects, so I do a lot of bugs. Uh, I'm not showing that today, but, but there might be a few bugs in the planetarium show, you never know. Uh, you'll have to check it out when it comes out. Um, so, and I've also created a few video series for the Noman Workshop and, and, and so on. Um, so let's talk about what I'm working on. So I'm working on a whole bunch of different shots, as we all are. Um, we're just talking about the stuff that we can show today. So I'm working on an exoplanet called TRAPPIST-1E. So it's about almost Earth size. Uh, it's in that sort of Goldilocks zone. We've seen it through telescopes, but uh, everything else is kind of basically what we glean from what we've understand through telescopes and science, right? Um, so this presents a few challenges, but also I have a little bit more luxury than Tom. Since I'm creating a terrain for TRAPPIST, uh, I don't have to use scientific data um, of the actual terrain. I can be a bit more creative and um, I have a little bit more freedom. So I have a slightly different approach um, to working with the terrain. Uh, but the cool thing, and, and, and when we talk about this planet in the show, the point that we we're trying to make, you know, we're looking for life in the universe. That's the whole point of the show. And we're looking at the planets where we think there might be life or the planets where we think it's probably unlikely that are life, uh, there, that there is life. So when we come to Trappist, it seems like it'd be a great place for life to grow on, but it has uh, a problem. It is tidally locked to the sun, just the way that our moon is tidally locked to, uh, to Earth. So that means that only one side of the planet faces the sun as it orbits the, its sun. So it's always the same day on that planet forever. So what we wanted to do when we were talking about this um, uh, planet is we wanted to show that because of this, it's a very cold planet, but there's like snow in the shadows and it's kind of like permanently there because the shadows are always in the same place. So, and the reason I mentioned this is, I'll illuminate when I get to my workflow. So this is some con early concept art that was created by Estevan Guzman, who um, sits uh, next to me and Tom, and Estevan and I talk about Star Wars and Star Trek all day long <laughs> until Tom's ears are bleeding, he can't take it anymore. Um, so it's a great show for Trekkies. Um, <laughs> So this is some of his concept art. This is some other concept art. It was created by Chris Butler and Don Dixon. Don Dixon is one of our directors, and he's also a very well-known space artist. He's done a lot of great stuff and a lot of famous images, what you may have seen on science fiction book covers and that kind of stuff. Um, so this is some of the early concept art that was created before I started on the show. This is what we wanted to match. So this is a little video clip. Uh, arrow button. Yes, that's the moon. <laughs> Those are numbers. And uh, this is an early animatic. So when I started on the show, this is kind of like super fast concept art that was given to me. So we're just kind of basically showing that uh, the, the planet is locked to its sun and we see uh, snow in the shadows. The one thing about this animatic, though, is you can see the light is hitting the snow. And that's something that we had to change. So the trick is, is that in our planet, the snow is only on the parts of the surface where there is no light. Right? So, so let's talk about the two challenges. The first challenge was to create a photoreal rocky terrain for an alien world. And the second challenge was to create snow only in the shadowed areas. So to tackle the first challenge, once we'd worked out the animatic and the rough camera move, I kind of blocked out some geometry, some rocks using ZBrush and, and uh, Z Remesher, just kind of sculpting arches and just rough rocks and then some real quick uh, snow here. So this is an image, just a screen grab from Maya that shows a kind of the, the second phase animatic of the shot. When we had this model, then we were able to set up the lights. Actually, Tom did the camera move, established the scale and the rough placement of the snow. Um, so at this point, once we got the animatic approved, then it was time to make the production model. So what I did is I took these models and I started the, the, the rough models, I started to break them up 
And so I could bring them into ZBrush and start doing the high resolution detail. So since I was able to be a bit more creative with the rocks on this planet, rather than using high rise data, I used mega scans. So I love mega scans. Uh, it's one of the, if you have never used mega scans, it's a great service, a subscription service, and they have scanned elements of all different things from rocks, plants, and trees, and so on. And then they're eventually gonna put us all out of work, right? Which is great. <laughs> um, you might be thinking, hey, Eric, you're a slacker. You're using scan data to make rocks. Well. I made enough rocks for Star Trek Beyond and I'm perfectly happy. And this guy, you know, every Great single day, rocks. every day was hassling me with the damn rocks. It felt like it's like a virtual chain gang or something like that. Uh, so on this show, I'm like, ah, I'm gonna cut, speed this up because I had to create a lot of terrain. So I used mega scans and, and what I did is I downloaded some of their rocky assets and uh, I used that to make some custom insert mesh brushes. So, and then I basically would Dynamesh, you know, break up my model in ZBrush, Dynamesh it, and then use the insert mesh brush to kind of jam rocks into the surface. So, uh, I'm gonna, if I want to switch to ZBrush, what do I hit? Alt. Yes. That's, that's, that's not ZBrush, man. It's okay. This one right there. Thank you. So what I'm gonna do is uh, I'm gonna load up uh, one of my custom brushes. Yeah, thanks uh, for presentation. And then go to Z tools. So I'll just load up one of these. So this is really just, you know, I loaded up a bunch of rocks from Megascans and then used, put them as sub tools and then you can instantly create an insert mesh brush. And what I'm gonna do is just to avoid any kind of um, crashing, I'm gonna use just a real simple model here. Let's get the, uh, Red wax. I'm not using red the wax. red wax material. Red wax. Uh, red wax. <laughs> uh, so what I'll do is uh, let's make this a polymesh 3D, and then uh, I'm going to dynamesh it. So what we got like 43,000. So let's bring this up a little bit more, and and then take one of these guys and just sort of drag it in here. So once I have a rock in here, I can use the move tool kind of position it and you know maybe I like something like that. Uh, I can choose a different rock or sometimes what I'll use is I'll hold the control key and then drag to make a duplicate of this. So you can see as I uh, insert each rock into the mesh, right, it's masking the other parts of the mesh so that I can continue to scale, manipulate, or I could even go in here and take like, you know, a uh, uh, move brush or whatever and just start moving this around and so on. So I did a lot of this kind of thing. And then of course, once I have a rocky surface that I like, I can control drag once to clear the mask and then again to re-dynamesh the surface, right? And then increase the geometry as I needed and then go in with some sculpting brushes like clay, uh, clay buildup and clay and so on uh, to add detail. The other cool thing I like about Megascans is that when you download um, like the rocks, uh, a lot of times they'll include the Z tool for their original scanned rock, uh, and then they'll also create uh, some of the alphas that they got from the scan. So I can use those alphas to kind of uh, fill in more detail. So um, if I go in here, let's see, get rid of this one. Let's take a look at one of the rocks that I had to make. Eventually, there we go. Switch over to a skin shader. I'm going to talk about these textures in just a moment, but you can see this. So this is kind of a finished version of a rock, and I've broken it out into subtools to make it a little bit more manageable. So the first stage was to create high re resolution detail using Dynamesh and the Insert Mesh Brush. Now for the second challenge was to create um, was it Alt what Alt Tab. There we go. Um, so the second challenge was, of course, to deal with the snow. And so in order to get the snow just in the shadows, of course, I need to get the lighting on the model so that I can use mesh extraction and ZBrush to create the snow. So uh, in order to do this, what I wanted to do was to go back into Maya and to use Arnold to bake the lighting into the rocks 
and then take, uh, bake that out as a texture and bring the texture back into ZBrush so then I can use mesh extraction to make the snow. So in order to do this, what I needed was UVs on my model so that I could you know, get the texture information. So I have the DynaMesh model, um, which is very high resolution and has kind of like an even topology all over it. So what I used then was ZRemesher, so I'd make a duplicate of my uh, model, and let's see if I have a decent uh, looking screen here. Okay, so I made a duplicate of the model of the DynaMesh version. I used ZRemesher to create a quick topology that was kind of quadded out. And then I used basically, um, if I go back here, I used uh, UV Master to quickly make some UVs. So one of the great things about UV Master, the real trick is to, um, go back to ZBrush here. Take a look at the topology. Um, it, when you're using uh, UV Master, what you can do is you can use polygroups as a way to, um, here, you see there's a mask on there. You can use polygroups as a way to quickly uh, determine where you want to have your UV shells. So if I like hide everything but this part of the model, and uh, then I'm going to do uh, Control W, and then bring back the rest of it, you can see now I have polygroups. So I spent a little bit more time than that on it. But then if you take this into UV Master, I can basically create uh, UV shells based on those polygroups. So then I have a model where I've used ZRemesher to make a more uh, quadded out topology, but a little bit lower resolution. Then I used UV Master to create UV shells. And then I took my original decimated version of the model and used projection to project the detail from the DynaMesh version onto the ZRemesh version. And I brought it into Maya and played with the UV shells a bit more. Okay, so that's a lot of stuff I'm throwing out there. If you're new to ZBrush and these terms sound foreign to you, I'm going to make a quick plug for the Z classroom. It's a free classroom. Joseph Drust, Paul Gavery, uh, Louis, a bunch of people have a lot of great video tutorials. They're all free. So if you're new to ZBrush, go to, to uh, the Z classroom, check out tutorials on Z Remesher, on DynaMesh, and so on, and projection. And some of this stuff will make sense to you. Say what? The there you go, man. Uh, <laughs> hey, I got to plug my friends. Um, you might recognize Louie's voice on some of those videos, too. Uh, or, or it might just appear in your nightmares. You never know. <laughs> um, so then what I did is uh, I had to go back into Maya. <laughs> so these are, these are basically, this is what it looks like. So all of this terrain you see right here, I had to do this process with, right? So I brought all these, the, this stuff back into Maya, and I used Arnold to bake the lighting into the model, the, the, the um, out to textures, so that I could get the shadow information. I bring the models back into ZBrush. I bring the textures into ZBrush, and I apply the textures to the models. And why am I doing this? It's because I want to create uh, basically masked areas in those shadows. So all these parts that are in shadows right here, if I convert those textures into poly paint and then use mask by uh, color, I can create a mask where all the dark shadows are and then I use mesh extraction to make the snow. Simple process, right? Um, it actually is pretty, once you've done it three or four times, it starts to become a really quick workflow. And if you compare it to actually trying to model snow in Maya, guessing where the lighting is, it actually ends up being a much faster process. So here's what the final shot looks like. Here's a still. We're going to show the actual shot in just a second. Um, and then there's some really nice uh, uh, visual effects that are added by our compositor and our visual effects arti artist. Um, so here is what the shot looks like. I'm going to hand this over to G so he can actually show you what it looks like in a matter is because I'm just going to screw up the hotkeys. <laughs> um, so Thank let's take a look much, at Alex. it. Thanks. Bear with me. And go. Take a little journey. So you can see we get really close to the rocks. So this is why using things like decimation. Yeah, the final um, step that I left out was when, once I'd had the uh, textures on the rock, I actually used decimation master 
with UVs so that I could bring in these high-res models with the UVs into Maya and finish the texturing process. A lot of the textures that you see on the rocks, I actually used Quixel Mixer, which is a really cool, uh, it's part of Megascans. Um, it's a really cool way to very quickly create repeating tileable textures uh, based on scan data. So that was also used to create the nice rocky look. Uh, and then, of course, uh, had lots of uh, back and forth between me and Don Fidrick over how to make the rocks look like rocks and not weird pizza dough. <laughs> um, and so that's what the final shot looks like. And it's really fun. I mean, it looks like you could go camping. It's like Joshua Tree <laughs> in space or some of that. But you can see how we had to be very care careful to keep the snow just in the shadowed areas. So we like to, like, again, uh, uh, fantastic work from Eric, fantastic work from Tom. We, um, Again, we, one of the things we try to do when we work on any of the shots is, especially when it involves a big environment that we do know a little bit about or we know nothing about, the goal is to say, well, what would it feel like if you were actually physically there? So as much as we want to rely on imagination when it makes it, we do have a bunch of experts that we talk to in the science community. So go back. Yeah, those planets you see in the sky, you have no idea how much work put into getting them in the exact right place. <laughs> Probably as much work as went into the rocks. Go back to the slide. Okay, so, okay, so back to me. Uh, we did talk a lot about rocks, beautiful, wonderful rocks that we love on the show, and about the planets, and there's a lot of science that we've kind of told you guys about. But also, the, just so you guys know, the show, there's more to the show. Uh, we love, again, all the science-based data and deriving that into something that, uh, for us science nerds, we'll just kind of, you know, get giddy about. But the show itself, we're trying to push it into more cinematic, more the imagination. So along with the stuff we do know, there's the things that we, we know the audience wants to see. So we want to cater to what the audience wants to see. So our concept artist, Estevan Guzman, has uh, created using um, your popular culture, literature, books, uh, cinema, movies, what Martians would look like. But yet, so they will have those elements that we understand as, as Martians, but kind of create them a little bit more unique to our show. So we don't just steal and rob from, you know, cinema. So we, our, our department uh, extensively researched what was out there in terms of like what people are familiar with when it comes to Martians. We also wanted to kind of, we have some shots, and I can't give it all away, where we kind of explore the imagination of some of these, these scientists. So we visualized that, which is a lot of fun. And of course, we just started getting into that, so there's only so much I can show. Um, it's a part of the show where I can say, no one can tell us we're wrong, right? <laughs> because there's no real science when it comes to the imagination. Um, so just to kind of give you guys a glimpse of some of the early kind of uh, 3D sculpts we've been doing to create Martians on our show. Um, here's kind of a, just a quick layout of them. And then we had started with a creature that kind of looks like inspired by War of the Worlds, uh, but I call it the half shrimp, half ginger root creature with War, War of the World infused. These are, these are G sculpts, by the way, just so you know. Yeah, and, so, and I'm going to open up, and I'm just going to, since we're low on time here, I'm going to just open up the ZBrush files and then just kind of give you guys a quick glimpse of what they look like in here. So, oops. That's not it. Okay, go to your rock. Yeah. All right, so now I go here. Go into projects. There he is. There he is. Sorry, I can't save your rock. Red wax. Red wax. No, no red wax. <laughs> Pink isn't bad. Pink wax. So you can kind of see, oh, that's what it is. So here's one of our, our creatures. 
that we're developing. Again, very much inspired by a shrimp and a, a ginger root. <laughs> but uh, uh, derived from the concept that Esteban started. So uh, we're now starting to put this character in production, and we're trying to stage him, and we're uh, in the process of retopologizing him, texturing him, rigging him as well. So we call him the Martian warrior creature. Um, also, We, we didn't stop there. We kind of wanted to take it even further because A, it's fun. B, you know, we control our own destiny a little bit on the show. <laughs> and we created kind of a, uh, get the big brain, you know, a Mars attack kind of critter in here. So we designed up a little um, Martian engineer, the smart one. So you got the, you know, the, the worker, and then you got the this engineer guy. So what that looks like, we'll jump into the hair. Pull this guy up. So that's kind of our engineer guy right there. And again, this is early concept as well for the critter. So he's um, he's being flushed out right now. He's being retopologized. And we, <laughs> we get the fun of now figuring out how he walks <laughs> in the show <laughs> and how he's going to operate uh, machinery and things like that. So, um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's all I'm going to show for that. Let me go to the next one. Uh, so, Signs of Life, 35 Minutes, May 2020 premiere. Uh, I want to thank our team here, but also our 25 uh, plus at the uh, satellite. Um, thanks to uh, Don Fidrick, our producer, Bob Niemack, our director, pr producer, um, Don Dixon, our systems team, O'Neill, Ben, Todd, uh, Carolyn. Um, if you guys want to know more about what we're doing or a little bit more about the observatory, it's right there, it's really close to here. So you guys definitely, here's a website to Griffith Observatory. Here's friends of the observatory who we actually technically work for. It's a nonprofit organization that has made this possible to create this show for you guys. If you guys live in Los Angeles, this show is being funded by, essentially by the city of Los Angeles. So if you live in Los Angeles and you pay your taxes, you guys are actually paying us to make this show. So uh, here's some resources as well, full dome databases out there. If you guys want to know more about the Planetarium Society, it's really cool. I myself didn't really know how much there was you can do and how there really, there are planetariums, there are dome productions that are happening that is really trying to push the envelope of storytelling and visualization. And I think right now we as uh, Griffith have Oh, I like to say we're trying to put a new bar on what planetarium shows will look like because a lot of people are used to what they've seen by back in kindergarten. And I think we're now trying to take it up a notch. Um, our science advisors, so we are serious about who we, you know, when we put imagery out there, we really want to be correct and we can brag about it that if you're on Mars, that this would be what it would look like on Mars. And our technical partners that we all are very thankful for and we couldn't have done our show without uh, everyone on this um, screen. And obviously, many, many thanks for Pixel Logic and having us here at the summit. Uh, Signs of Life, please, uh, May 2020, come out and see it. Thank you very much. We're going to be taking questions in the library uh, afterwards, uh, I think right after this. So if you guys have any questions, by all means, come up and uh, we'll try to answer them. Okay? Thank you very much. Thanks, Louis. So I also wanted to mention, I also wanted to mention this, this presentation is, uh, is sponsored by Wacom, so that's, uh, that's something also that we wanted to throw out there. Um, do you mind taking one of the Twitter questions uh, now? Is that all right? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, cool. So we'll go, uh, we'll go here. The question is uh, from one of our Twitch viewers. It's uh, Daniel Bauer, not to be confused with the hockey skate company. <laughs> Which resolution do you use when importing high-res maps into ZBrush or Houdini? Sounds Which like resolution do you oh, use no, when importing high-res maps into ZBrush or Houdini? It's, uh, I think it's your well, for, for Houdini, for the, yeah, for the Mars uh, map, that was a 32-bit float, very high-resolution map. Uh, the, the good thing about Houdini is it can handle just about any resolution you throw at it. Okay. Uh, the pixel dimensions on that, I don't recall right off the top of my head, but they're probably like 30,000 by... 120,000, I mean, it's crazy. Okay. But, but Houdini handles it just yeah. fine. I would not try and import anything like that into ZBrush. Okay. 
All jokes aside, that's serious business. Uh, does anybody <laughs> have any, can, I, can I take a few questions from the audience for right now? Is that all right? Yeah, we take a question. Yeah, okay. got time. Take, you have a question? Now's your chance. Yeah. Don't hesitate. Where are you? Okay, shout it out because my brick is missing. I can't throw something at you today. <laughs> I'm not sure. Julie, what's that? I'll get the brick, I promise. Hang on a second. <laughs> to keep my lady happy here. Where's the brick? The Hold on a second here. Throw the brick. Toss me the brick there, Roll. Yeah. Don't hit anybody. Let's give it a good lunge there. Oh, wait a second. Look at that. Oh, oh man. Oh. Didn't drop the ball, man. Okay, go ahead. I made the team, coach. Okay. When you're Speaking of the box, man. When you're rendering out uh, the cameras from Maya or wherever you're doing it, yeah. do you have to match the projector cameras? Are you rendering out one camera, multiple cameras? Yeah, that's a really good question. We used to have a process called 5Cam, where we actually have a rig that points to five separate locations, northeast, southwest, and up. And that was the previous method of getting it done. With Arnold, they do have what's a, a native fisheye lens shader, which makes our life tremendously easy. We don't have to do this post-process where we take the five cams and stitch them all together in a composite. So everything we see, we have a, we have a camera rig that has a cam guide because obviously you can't mimic a 300 or 180 degree view because that doesn't really exist in the real world unless you're actually parenting more than one camera together. So in CG land, in your uh, viewport, you're not gonna be able to get obviously that view active live, but we've worked really, because we've been working with this so much, I think all of ours can now look into your IPR viewer in Arnold and kind of interactively work, knowing that where the sweet spot is, where up is, where back is and stuff, and kind of work that way. But yeah. we also have a guide cam that allows us to see a kind of a wide field of view at, that kind of exactly follows the, um, the 180 degree cam. Yeah, there's a lot of animation in the show that's beyond just camera fly throughs and terrain, and yes. it takes a while to, it, it sounds easy, but once you actually do it, it's much yeah. harder than it sounds to realize that the stuff at the top of the screen is actually gonna be behind you in the dome. So the Amateris, the dome uh, software, which is free, right? Yeah, it's free. Yeah, it's that, free. that's really helpful too. So we can see the shots before, yeah. and we have that little mini dome in the studio that we can use. But yeah, Arnold has been a real lifesaver because of that fisheye thing. It's just yeah. built right in there. It's in, yeah. it's in Maya. And in Houdini, we have a special uh, uh, fisheye lens shader as well. So that was, uh, I think mm -hmm. we got that from a planetarium, mm -hmm. another uh, planetarium to use. So that's been a lifesaver as well. So. Yeah. Really cool stuff, man. Yeah. Anybody else? One more. <laughs> Question right there. Right there. <laughs> Julie thought you were going to talk about There's this. One right there. <laughs> There's some hands. Where's that? How long are your 8K renders? Uh, <laughs> oh, man. Oh, oh man. Um, Let me check my out. phone. So, so we are rendering, uh, we are lighting in, in, in full 32-bit floating point on some of our shots, and we are generating some uh, biometric elements. We have had frames take four days per frame. <laughs> That's probably the far extent of our, um, our the heaviest so far at this point, but we've had frames that come out really quick. We're, very, we're being very organized in how we step up our resolution. So we start at 2K, we try to keep our samples low, we try to get a final around 4K, then we call it a tech fix to get to 8K. That means you only get one 8K iteration because it takes that long to create, uh, push out 8K. Yeah. And we so. go up to the big dome when it's not open to the public and actually yeah. preview the shot. So every once in a while you get to see what your shot's going to look like for yeah. better or for worse on that it canvas. It is <laughs> so impressive. I mean, it is by far, I've, I've worked on a lot of movies. These guys have worked on a lot of movies. It is by far the biggest, most impressive screen I think I'll ever work on in my life, being so large. It's four times bigger than your standard movie screen. Absolutely. So, yeah. It's a great facility as well. So Beautiful place. On behalf of myself, Louis Tucci here live from the Zero Summit, I want to thank, uh, I want to thank you guys again. Uh, G, Eric, Tom, thank you so much. Uh, let's thank put you. our hands together here inside the green screen. Shout out to Hollywood sign. Okay.